everybody. Good evening to you. I'm Nate Eaton. This is Courtroom Insider. Today is the 18th of April. It's 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Hang on. We have a lot to talk about. I'm warning you up front. We're going to go long tonight. It's This show will probably be longer than an hour. There is so much to talk about. We could have done this in two days. Everything that happened today was just crazy crazy so much to talk about i was there the whole day have a lot i want to talk to you about um thank you for being here please let us know where you're watching from and if you have any questions and i'm going to walk you through the highlights of today i have never seen judge boyce as angry as he was this afternoon he was not happy he said that from the bench an attorney filed a motion to intervene the Friday before jury selection was supposed to begin, ruined the judges and his staff's Easter, and the judge just kind of unloaded on him. And this this was unlike anything I have seen. I'm going to play it for you in full. Well, most of it, at least. You have to see this. To... to to uh, say that the judge was offended by this attorney and what he did was unbelievable. And I talked to the attorney after. He didn't have anything to say. I'll show you the video of him leaving, leaving the courthouse. So we have a lot to talk about, but Melanie Gibb was on the stand. Melanie Gibb in the inner circle of Chad and Lori for so long and Alex and Zulema and Melanie uh, Boudreaux and all of these people. She took the stand. She testified today. We're going to talk about that. So much to talk about. I didn't know what to title the show, so I titled it Melanie Gibb Testifies. Hold on one. And I wondered if it would do that. I think I'm back. Okay, Melanie Gibb Testifies. Here's what we've got tonight. The forensic accountant, he was on the stand yesterday, the guy with the FBI. He wrapped up this morning. We'll touch on a little bit of that about the money and the finances and the things that were happening uh, with the Venmo accounts. It was interesting that after Tylee died, the Venmo activity on her account with her brother skyrocketed versus before she was alive. We'll walk through that. Of course, Melanie Gibb, as I mentioned, takes the stand. I have a bunch of little clips I want to play for you of that in case you missed the testimony. She talked about castings. For the first time, I believe, a witness used the term zombie in this trial. I think that this may have been the first time the jurors heard that term, at least from a witness's mouth. Um, I, it may, they may have said it in opening statements, the uh, prosecution or the defense, but I don't know if a witness has said it until now. Dark and light, the dark and light scale. We have the call that Melanie Gibb made to Chad and Lori, where she basically called Lori evil, called her a core whore, called her all sorts of, basically said she had been deceived by Satan. And, you know, Lori didn't take that well. Lori was with Chad when the call was made. I'll play you a bit of it. Prior Grills Gibb. Prior spent more time on Melanie Gibb cross-examining her than any other witness. Took up all of the afternoon, and he's not done. He's going to start tomorrow. I'll play you a few of those clips. Then that attorney hearing that I was telling you about just a minute ago, we'll go through that. We'll remember, of course, Tammy, JJ, and Tylee, and I want to be sure that we answer your questions. So, again, we have a, a full slate ahead of us today. Here's who was on the stand as I witnessed. Not that black screen. There we go. Melanie Gibb. And Terry Ratliff. Now, he was not on the stand. Terry Ratliff is the attorney from Mountain Home, Idaho, who filed a motion to intervene in the case, uh, right, as I said, right before Easter, right before it started. And he, while he wasn't on the stand, he was called before the judge to answer some questions. And so those were the two key people today. Melanie Gibb is witness number 10, who I have in my notebook. And um, she is the first, I guess you could say, civilian witness, if that's what you want to call it. Because up until now, we've had pretty much all law enforcement. Yeah, all law enforcement, other than like the FBI accountant and the um, Nicole Heideman, who's like an analyst with the FBI or a special agent with the FBI. But, but up until now, it has just been law enforcement. So she was the first civilian to take the stand and... And a lot of these terms, the jurors are hearing for the first time as they try to piece it together. 
Okay, so let me real quick recap what Michael Douglas said. This is the Michael Douglas who is not Tammy Daybell's brother. She does have a brother named Michael Douglas, and it's not the actor. This is the guy who is the FBI accountant. He t testified yesterday about finances, money being moved around, um, around the times of the children's death, even before that, definitely after it, money with Chad, Alex, Lori. He said that Colby was sent $170, Colby, Lori's oldest son, was sent $170 totaling four times over the course of four Venmo transactions during the seven months before Tylee died. So Tylee sent her brother money four times, total was $170. Kind of, kind of an average thing. I mean, every, every other month, send him, you know, 30, 40 bucks. Um, so that was pointed out. But here's the interesting thing. Tylee died September 10th of 2019 and Michael Douglas testified that he, Colby, then received from Tylee's account 29 payments totaling over $5,000 after Tylee died. And these payments were done, money would be transferred quickly from into Tylee's account from an external account belonging to Lori and then quickly transferred off to Colby. Uh, interesting, interesting note there. Lori, oh, the, one of the other things we learned today is that Lori, after Joseph Ryan died, there was a lot of questions on, did she get a life insurance policy? How much did she get when he died? Uh, this was again, her husband number three. Um, she got a life insurance policy, we learned today, it was over $64,000. And she told Melanie Gibb about that, and they had documentation that proved she got that life insurance policy. So that's one of the questions we've had all along. Um, I, that, I believe that did come out at Lori's trial, but it must have slipped my mind because people have asked. So she did get a relatively decent amount of life insurance after Joseph Ryan died. And that was about it for Michael Douglas's testimony. He testified a about a few more things. He will not be recalled. They're done questioning him. And Melanie Gibb walked into the courtroom ready to go. Now, she started the testimony. Lindsay Blake questioned her. And she started the testimony by sharing about the time that she met Chad. She met Chad before Lori. And then she met Lori, separate events. And, and both Lori and Melanie had read Chad's books. And they both liked them. There was an event in October of 2018 in St. George, Utah, where the three of them got to meet each other for the first time, uh, as far as the three of them together. They, they all kind of knew each other, but Lori had never met Chad, and Chad had never met Lori. And Lori went right over to where he was selling his books, and she started to help sell his books. Now, think, think about this. If you're Chad Daybell, and you've gone to these conferences to sell these books, and this beautiful blonde woman comes up and starts saying that she loves your work and she starts to tell you, she starts to s help you sell your books. Uh, I'm sure he was a little flattered by that. And Melanie Gibbs says right away, right away, <laughs> Chad starts telling Lori that they were married in previous lives. They had previous probations that, um, uh, you know, they... I don't know, they, they had different plant. they lived on different planets. And Melanie Gibb went through that they had previous names and that Lori was, um, I don't even remember all, the, the, all, the, all of the people who she was and who Chad was, but basically they had had these lives. Hit it off right away, right away. Conference ends, Melanie and Lori then drive home to Arizona and there's other people in the car. And I want to play this clip of what Melanie Gibbs said the conversation was like on their way home. She said that they talked about multiple lives. And I believe she talked about, um, you know, how many lives that she had lived on this earth and that she indeed was married to someone named Moroni in a previous life. Those kind of conversations. Yeah. <clears throat> Prior to meeting Chad Daybell, did Lori tell you if, did Lori ever talk about multiple probations before that or multiple lives? She did. So she had some interest in that subject matter already? Yes. But when you talked to her about her conversation with Chad at that conference, 
she told you Chad gave her some additional information? That's right. Did she say anything regarding what Chad had told her about she and Chad? That they had been married in previous probations. Did Lori seem receptive of that information? She did. Okay, so you catch it there that this was not something foreign to Lori. She had heard about it. She had talked about it. She embraced the idea. And the Chad and Lori relationship just blossomed from there. Gibb said that they uh, talked a lot. And just a few weeks later, they met up at another conference. And this one was in Arizona. And this is where Chad Daybell spent the night at Lori Vallow's house. Charles was out of town. There were also other people at the home who were all women. She said that maybe Alex Cox was there. She didn't quite remember, but the rest of the people at the house were women. And Lori would go on walks with Chad, and they would talk together and um, started calling each other. I mean, it was an instant, instant sort of relationship. Melanie went on to talk about the light and dark scale and how people are light and dark based on their level of righteousness, I guess you could say. If you were really unrighteous, you were dark. And not only were you dark, but you had a level assigned to you. If you were really righteous, you were light, and you, again, had a level assigned to you. The, from what I have heard from reliable people who have seen this chart, Oprah Winfrey was one of the darkest people on the list. She may have been the darkest person. Law enforcement were dark on the list once they started investigating this case. Makes you wonder who else was on the list and who else was dark. I'm going to play a clip about the dark and the light scale. Did Lori ever talk to you about her conversations with Chad? Yes. Do you know, did Lori ever share with you if she turned to Chad for advice? She did. It's, and we talked a little bit about the multiple lives or multiple probations already, correct? Yes. At some point, did Chad or Lori share more information about that with you? Yes. And which one of them? Um, they both did. Do you know which one of them seemed to have the most understanding regarding multiple probations? Yes, Lori would often call Chad and Chad would give her the information and then she would come back and share it with me and her other friends. And when she would share the information, would she tell you she got that from Chad? Yeah. At some point, did Chad or Lori talk to you about the concept of light and dark? Yes. Do you recall who talked to you about that? Lori shared it with me. Did she tell you where she got that information from? She got it from Chad. What did she share with you about the concept of light and dark? So if someone was light, they had made contracts with Jesus Christ before they came here. And if they were dark, they had made contracts and promises with Satan. And it was a different scale level of how dark, dark or light they were. So it was a decision before they came here to earth. Yes. Contract. Initially, yes. And then with regard to the multiple probations, as you learned more about that, what what did Lori share with you regarding multiple probations? Um, that people lived multiple times. Um, and then she would find out, you know, she would try to find out like when that was. And was there some kind of a rating system or a system to easily identify if someone was light or dark or what level they were? Um, she would ask him and he would somehow find out and he would find out, you know, how many times they've been on this planet or any other planets, I guess. And he would just find that out by asking questions the way he did, and then she would share it with us. And when, and the he you're referring to, is that Chad? Yes. At some point, um, 
were people designated with a number and then either an L or a D? Correct. Where would those designations originate? From Chad. Okay. So she's making the connection to Chad. And Blake is leading, not leading her. Blake is asking her questions, these questions of who, who was behind all of this. Chad, he came up with the light and dark scale. He came up with the L's and the D's and the numbers. And Lori, Gib repeatedly said today through her testimony, Lori would go to Chad, Chad would tell her, then Lori would share it with the group. Gib actually had very little interaction with Chad. They uh, spoke at a couple of, they went to these events together, these camps or, or, or conferences or whatnot. But really, it's Lori who's constantly talking to Chad she had her own phone. They had their own phones for each other that were just for each other. Lori had three phones. Chad had at least two. So you have your everyday phone, and then you have just the, the one line that goes directly to Lori and Chad so they could talk to each other directly. Or James and Elena. They call each other different names all the time. So Lori goes on to tell Melanie that her mission in life is to gather women to be part of the 144,000 who will usher in the second coming of the Lord, of Jesus Christ. And this is a, a doctrine, I, I don't know much about it, in the Bible uh, that says that there will be 144,000 gathered, and Lori and Chad felt that they were to gather these group, this group and prepare, and that they would lead this group as part of the second coming. And so Melanie was told that she would be part of this group. And if I, um, some of you that watched today might be like, wait, she didn't quite say that. If she didn't say it today, she said it during, I interviewed her at length, hours and hours a few years ago. And that was brought up today in court. Well, one of her interviews was. Um, so if, I, if you're like, wait, I didn't hear her say that, it could have come from the interview. I, I sometimes in my head get confused what came where, but basically, they told Melanie that she was part of this righteous group. So out of all the people in the world who would be dark, but, but not just dark, the, the doctrine, the teaching got elevated from just dark and light to zombies. A new term that came along, a term that Melanie said Lori was uncomfortable with in the beginning or a little um, uneasy when Ch Chad first told her about zombies and guess guess who out of all the people in the world guess who was the first zombie out of anyone on the planet it was charles vallow charles vallow had a zombie and so they had to get rid of the zombie and they decided that they would get together and cast the zombie out of Charles. Now, we first heard about these casting ceremonies, prayers, I, I don't know what you call it, back in Lori's trial. But Melanie elaborated on it today about these castings, and Chad attended some of the castings. Now, I'm going to play you this clip. Gibbs going to testify about these castings, and she's going to be asked if Chad came to one involving Brandon Boudreaux. I purposely left it on the four screen. Watch Ch Chad's reaction as Melanie Gibb is testifying about these castings. And at one point, he flat out shakes his head like, no, I wasn't. This was the one witness Chad took notes. Chad was not scrolling on his computer. He took notes. He was consulting with John Pryor. John Pryor took note page after page after page of notes. They, this was the witness. John Pryor said yesterday or the day before that Melanie Gibb was the key witness in this case. And he was going to be sure he got everything he needed out of her. But before that, here is her talking about castings. Did you ever participate in any castings? I did. Can you tell me a little bit about what would happen at the casting? Um, so Lori and a few of her friends would stand in a circle and then um, feel like they had the power and authority to cast out the evil spirit by trying to use words, I guess, like an energy work to be able to convince them to leave and hoping that the evil spirit would leave. So would some of the individuals say a prayer? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would some of the individuals um, talk about sending spiritual weapons or something of that nature? Yes. Was the person that the casting was being done on physically present? No. Was anyone physically touching, doing anything to, in this case, Charles? No. Do you recall, did you participate in the castings for Charles? Yes. At any point, did Lori tell you whether or not the casting was successful? Um, yes. And what did she share with you? She would say that that Ned had left, and then <clears throat> shortly after, she would say somebody else got in, another entity. Do you know who told her that information or where she got it from? Yes, she got it from Chad. And did she tell you that? Yes. At some point, did you learn what would happen to the body if the casting was actually successful? Um, she would say that that the body would was supposed to die if they if it would if the evil spirit left. So in Charles' case, Ned's out and a new spirit's in. Correct. Do you know if there were additional castings? Yes. In relation to Charles, I should say. Yes. Did you participate in, in, in any additional castings? Yes. Do you know if at any point the next entity or spirit was cast out of Charles, according to Lori? Yes. And was it? According to her, it was. And did she tell you where she received that information? From Chad. And then what happened in relation to Charles when that next entity was removed according to Lori? Nothing happened to Charles. Did a new entity come in? According to her. And did she tell you where she learned that from? Yes, uh, and, Chad. Was Chad ever present for any of the castings? Uh, yes. Were there castings done on other individuals besides Charles that you know of? Yes. And who were some of those individuals? Um, Brandon Boudreaux was one that I know of. And did you participate in a casting on Brandon Boudreaux? I don't know if I said anything. I was just was there when they did it. Do you know if Chad was present at that one? Yes, he was. Did you notice Chad nodding his head like, no, I wasn't, and he started to take notes? Melanie Gibb did admit to John Pryor that she does have memory issues. She forgets things. But but also think about think about this. Can you remember things from five years ago, four years ago? Granted, these are pretty dramatic events. These are pretty, uh, out, I don't want to say outlandish. They're pretty far out there. So you'd think you'd remember some, but but maybe maybe to Melanie and Lori and Charles, uh, uh, Alex and Chad, this was everyday stuff. So how how could you remember who was it? one particular meeting versus the other. I want you to think for a minute about the first time, maybe tonight is the first time you're hearing this about castings and light and dark and zombies. I know many of you are new to the case and I'm sure your mind is like, what? And what is the first thing we want to do when we hear something that sounds a little crazy we want to go tell someone. At least I do. I'm a reporter. So what I did when I learned about this stuff years ago, I went home to my wife. I'm like, honey, you will not believe this. And I told her and she went, what? Think about these jurors who, who are hearing this. They can't go home and tell, tell their friends or their spouses. They can't even talk with each other about it. And this is the first time they're hearing this stuff. What in the world are they thinking? I will tell you today, many of those jurors took more notes than I have seen all week. There were some, they were intently listening to Melanie Gibb. Today, the time flew. It was not like, all right, when's the break? It was like, oh, it's already a break. They were, they were listening to what she said and then they couldn't go home and talk about it. And, and also, uh, the other thing that I wonder is, I mean, I just love to ask questions. I don't understand things right away. And so I ask a gazillion follow-up questions. They can't ask any questions. They can't be like, wait, hold up. What? Zombies? Ned Schneider? Dark light? What? Uh, they can't do that. 
They just have to go with what they he- what they hear. So they heard that. They heard that Charles was dark. They got together to cast him out. Chad was there at some of them, according to Gibb, especially for Brandon Boudreaux. They did multiple casting spells. Of, of course, the, the dark ones are Charles and Brandon, Tammy eventually, but no one else that we know of. J.J. Tiley, but no one else that we know of. Gibbs said that Alex's mission was, was to protect Lori. Lori's mission was to gather women for the 144,000. But Chad told Alex his mission was to protect Lori. And what did Alex do? He quit his job. He moved to Rexburg. He got a $21,000 loan. He bought 43 guns. And he was willing to protect his sister and do whatever she wanted. Okay, so this is the morning session. Now, normally every day around 10 o'clock, we have a break for about 20 to 30 minutes. Today, someone's phone alarm went off during the morning session and the the person didn't claim it. Like normally you kind of hold it up in shame and say, here, it was me. So because of that, the bailiff held us after the judge said, go on break. So everybody in the audience was held in the courtroom while he told us to shape up and turn off your phones. While this was happening, and he swears to me, the bailiff told me he did not purposely hold us back. He had no clue what was going on. But a lady who's been, I won't name her, but I know her, and she gave me the tip. She was outside in line waiting to get in for the next part of the court hearing. So you can't, if you leave, you can't go back in. She was waiting. She says, she told me that Right when that morning session ended, Pryor came running out and said, where is he? Where is he? And then Melanie Gibb left the stand and a bondsman or somebody came up to try to serve her papers and said, ma'am, ma'am, these are for you. These are for you. Gibb said, I'm not taking those. Pryor said, you have to take them. And then the prosecutors walked out and said, she doesn't have to take those while she's on the stand. (laughs) What? So this happened out there right in front of the courtroom. The attorney started to talk. And then after we went back in, the judge called them all back into his chambers for a a discussion. We don't know what happened with the discussion. So my neighbor was saying, well, how could she was already on the stand? Why would John Pryor try to serve her with a subpoena? She's on the stand for the state. And there are there are rules like the, whatever the prosecutor asks, they can ask whatever because she's their witness. John Pryor can cross-examine, but he has to stay within the bounds generally with, with the topics. He, he, he has to stay within the bounds um, the prosecution has said, or they can object and say it was out of the scope. Uh, sometimes it's very broad uh, and it's all over the place. Just sometimes it's, you know, they'll object and say it's beyond the scope. So Pryor was obviously trying to serve her with the subpoena, what one would imagine, to be his witness so that he could call her back and testify on what she saw on behalf of the defense. And it appears she has avoided getting that subpoena for years. Mark Means, Lori Vallow's old attorney, tried the same thing during Chad Daybell's preliminary hearing in 2021, no, 2020, August of 2020. Uh, a, ba- a bondsman showed up at Melanie Gibbs Hotel, tried to serve her with a subpoena on behalf of Mark Means and Lori Vallow, and Gibb refused to take it. I wish I could have been in the hall. That would have happened in front of all of us, and it would have been something to see. So as if we thought that was the wild moment of the day, no, get ready. We have the next wild moment on tape because it happened in the courtroom. So we go back to lunch and we go back to the, to the courtroom. Sorry about that. And um, the question comes up about Lori and Chad having these relationships and they both still have married spouses. And why didn't they just get a divorce? Here's what Melanie said. And she shared with you that there was some physical, some kind of physicalness within their relationship. Correct. Did she tell you whether or not she thought that was okay because they were both married? Yes. She said that every time she would um, get together with Chad, she would always ask Jesus if what was acceptable or appropriate that she could interact with Chad. 
And if she felt she had the affirmation that it was okay, then she would do it? I assume. Did she tell you where they would meet up? Um, hotels. Did you ever talk to Chad or Lori about uh, whether either of them were seeking a divorce? Yes. What did you learn in relation to that? I asked why weren't they getting a divorce, and she told me that if Chad were to seek after a divorce, that um, he would be in trouble with Jesus, that he would lose his exaltations. Did she tell you where she got that information? She got it from Chad. She got it from Chad. So they never got divorced. Gibb goes on to say that after Lori moved to Rexburg, end of August 2019, beginning of September, Tylee goes missing September 8th. Remember the Yellowstone trip? Gibb comes up to visit for a conference. Um, uh, I think it was a conference on the Book of Mormon about, um, I, I forget, the history or the science behind the Book of Mormon, something like that. And it's held in Rexburg, but she's staying with Lori. She flew in. She didn't recall. It was either a Wednesday or a Thursday. And Lori picked her up from the airport in Idaho Falls and drove her to Rexburg, about 30-minute drive. Lori goes into the townhome where um, um, Lori is living. Melanie goes into the townhome where Lori is living. And originally, Melanie was staying in Tylee's room. But there was nothing of Tylee's in the room, just furniture, no clothes, nothing. Remember, Tylee's dead at this point, but Melanie doesn't know. She asks Lori where Tylee is, and Lori tells her that she's at BYU-Idaho and she has roommates. They never saw Tylee the rest of the weekend. Tylee never called her mom. Lori never called her daughter. That was it. Uh, they, JJ was there. JJ's room was next to Tylee, and then the master room was kind of down the hall where Lori was staying. The uh, group, Alex was there on and off because Alex had his own town home and Chad was there kind of on and off. Um, Melanie Gibbs said there was kissing between Chad and Lori, holding hands. In fact, they went to the BYU-Idaho track and were walking around and holding hands. And Melanie asked if Chad was worried that Tammy might see them holding hands there in Rexburg. And uh, Lori, I think, said something like, well, Tammy doesn't get out or she's not going to see or whatnot. So um, Melanie said she was just kind of, I guess, confused at this point or didn't really know what to think. I know many of you have really, really strong opinions about Melanie Gibb. You can't stand her. You despise her. The other half of you think she's brave and did some good things and... Um, Maybe some of you are down the middle, and I'm not here to judge either side. I, I can see how everybody would think a bunch of stuff. Um, and it was it definitely sounds like a very complicated situation. But then to some, you might say it wasn't that complicated. Where were the kids, and why didn't they call her out? But, you know, we know a lot more than they knew, na than, than they knew then. Well, then, um, Saturday, Melanie goes to this Book of Mormon conference. She's there all day. It was not sponsored by the church um but she didn't say much about the conference but then sunday afternoon they go to look at some land her and david at this point her boyfriend has arrived in rexburg who is now her husband and many of you have asked if they're still married they are still married she said but they don't live together she lives in arizona he lives in utah uh but they're still married so on sunday they go to look at this plot of land with a realtor and she didn't say this on the stand, but she has said this publicly in the past. Chad was really trying to convince David to buy this plot of land and said, this will be the, the settling where the second coming will happen. And, and there'll be people here that are gathered. And this is where we can put things. And, and David just wasn't into it. They just didn't, he didn't want to get the land, but they did look at the land. They go back to Lori's house. And that night they record a podcast, Lori, David, and Melanie. Chad, at one point, JJ's there and he scratches Chad's neck and 
Chad takes him upstairs and deals with him. I, we don't know what happened, but he did come down the stairs holding JJ's hand and JJ was a lot calmer, but he was scratched on the neck and Melanie Gibb asked what, what happened. And he said, JJ scratched me. Well, then um, they record this podcast and this is the last time that JJ is seen alive. Alex brings JJ in. He's asleep on Alex's shoulder in red pajamas and Alex takes him out. They finish recording around midnight. Melanie goes to bed. She was in the same room as David that night, David Warwick that night, she said, but they had moved into JJ's room from Tylee's room. They were in JJ's room. Lori in her room, according to Melanie, had a little corner, like a mattress area where the, um, the JJ could sleep if he needed to in his mom's room or he could sleep in his room. Middle of the night, Melanie says David wakes up with a horrible nightmare. Just a horrible nightmare. To the point he wakes up Melanie and Melanie's concerned and she wants to call Chad to give David a priesthood blessing, like a prayer. And he, she does call and text Chad and Chad does not respond. She then goes to Lori's room to try to get her to give a blessing or contact Chad for a blessing. I'm, I'm not really sure what, but, she, but the door was locked. She tried to open the door and it was locked. And then she couldn't reach either of them. So she goes back into her room with David, falls asleep, says she wakes up around 7 o'clock and JJ's gone, but she didn't ask where JJ was. She didn't say if she did, but remember David Warwick last year testified that in the morning he asked Lori where JJ was. And that's when Ty or Lori said that JJ had been acting like a zombie. He had climbed up on the cabinets, knocked down a picture of Jesus that was on the fridge and that Alex was taking care of him. Melanie did not testify to that today. Melanie goes home, but also during this visit, Lori had told her that she needed to have Kay Woodcock, her JJ's grandmother, take JJ because JJ was too much of a handful and there was too much going on. And that in order for Lori to fulfill her mission, she needed Kay to take JJ. And she came up with a story to say that I'm, I was that Lori was going to be sick. She would meet Kay in an airport, drop JJ off to her, and all would be well. And she told Melanie eventually that that's what happened. And time goes by. And Melanie's down in Arizona, and it's November, around Thanksgiving. And the police call, and um, JJ is gone. And uh, after t some time, Lori calls Melanie and says, tell the police, don't answer. Well, first of all, Chad calls and says, don't answer the phone. And then they say, go to the movie theater and take a picture of random kids and tell them you're at Frozen. Gibb admitted that she originally told police that JJ was with her, but she sent JJ back to Lori. After some time, she went back to the police and said, I lied and told them everything she knew. She then called and confronted Chad and Lori. And I want to play some of that call. Um, not the whole call, but some of it, because it's like 20 minutes. Um, we have this on our YouTube page if you want to hear the whole one, whole call. I want, I'm going to play the version of the, the, the court play today so you can look at Chad Daybell as this call is played. And you can hear kind of the tones in their voice and whatnot. They didn't know it was being recorded, but it's a good thing Melanie did record it. Sweet Melanie. Hi, Chad. Hey, Lori. Hi. Hey, let me put on speaker. Oh, okay. Lori. We're in a <laughs> How are you guys? Hey, Kay. How are you doing, babe? I'm doing pretty good, thanks. I was wondering, where, where are you guys? We're just hanging out. Hey, are you are you in Idaho? We're yeah. in Idaho. Oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question, if you don't mind, Lori. Yeah. Um, I want to know. Um, you remember we talked about JJ going to Kay's house, and you told me they went there, and now he's not there. I was wondering what happened. 
Well, I had to move him somewhere else because of her actions. So was she was she doing something? Like was she trying to come get him or something, or like trying to kidnap him? Well, she's yeah, she said that lots of times before, but um. Okay. I, well, when, you know, when I asked Chad the other day, I was like, hey, um, you know, where, where is JJ? And he said, for my security, he didn't want me to know. So is there a reason I should be in danger to know where he is? <laughs> no, it's nobody. It's his danger. It's the danger that there's people after me. Okay. Well, so, it's, it's, it's you, Nick, that puts you in it. Danger. Well, just in a bad position. In a bad position. Everybody, yeah. if they don't know anything, then they don't have to say they know. Right. So you're just worried. Okay. Um, I'm just to keep him protected and, and keep you protected and keep everybody else. I appreciate that. Um, well, I was wondering why you told the police why he was with me. <laughs> I just needed to use top somebody that I so I wouldn't have to tell them where he really was because they were gonna tell Kay where he is. Oh uh, yeah. So is that you think it's like your family or you know, like your family, your dad or you know, the well, my people? Family, well not my whole family, but you know, as you know, most of my family is working against me and yeah. With her basically. Yeah. Is JJ safe? He is safe and happy. Okay, well, that's good to hear. Um, are you afraid of anything? Like, are you afraid to tell me that you're just afraid that he, um, that I could be in danger? Like, you're, you know, like, I don't, like, if I knew, like, how could that hurt me? I don't understand how that could hurt me if I knew where he was. Well, I'm just not telling anybody so that nobody has to say where he is or get questioned to where he is so I can keep him as safe as possible. Yeah. Um, okay. I hope, well, I hope that he's okay. I hope you guys are okay. But I did have a question that I asked Al at one point, your brother, um, if, um, if I wanted to know, you know, um, like where he was and... He said, I did not want to know and that he could not be found. So what does that mean? I don't know if he would say that, but it's the same story. Like, I, yeah. I, I don't even want Al to know. I don't want anybody to know so that nobody has to be worried about it. I mean, nobody has to be yeah. questioned about it so he can be safe. Yeah, so are you, I mean, are you, how, how long are you going to be away for? Like, how, I mean, are you ever going to be able to come out and come back to society again? Or are you going to keep, you know, like, come back? I mean, like, what does that look like? I will do whatever the Lord needs me to do every day, so. Okay. I just wondered if I was ever going to see you again. Absolutely, you will. Okay, so. Yep. So maybe when they're done chasing you, you'll be able to come out of, you think they will come out again or? Yeah, I mean, it's a ridiculous thing for them to be working with Kay to find me. There's nothing that's gone on that's, you know what I'm saying? Like they're working yeah. with her in some dark capacity. The police are working with her in some mm -hmm. dark capacity. There's no reason for them to be after me uh -huh. in the first place. Hmm. Yeah, has she has she threatened you at all? Yes, lots of times. Oh boy. Like did she, what did she say? Well, it's in emails and everything. So. Hmm. so like she said she was gonna come take them or she was There's a lot of things. Yeah. Nelly. I know it sounds like it. I'm just worried for you guys because you know, he's missing, and, you know. I know exactly where he is. He's perfectly okay. fine and safe. Okay, well, I hope so. He's perfectly I healthy I and safe, see. Lori said there. Again, you can go listen to the entire thing. We've got it 
on our YouTube channel. And this this call isn't new. It was played at it was played at Melanie Gibbs' preliminary hearing with Chad Daybell back in 2020. So we knew about it four years ago, and then it was played again in Lori Vallow's trial. She goes on to call Lori, base, or uh, yeah, to call Lori and Chad. She tells them they've been deceived by Satan, and that um, they are Korah whores, which is basically an antichrist. And uh, Lori hangs up on her. We think Melanie Gibbs said the call was disconnected, but it sounded like a hang up. And you can go listen to it and make your own decision, make up your own mind on that. So at one point, Melanie asked Alex, do you really believe in this zombie stuff? And he said, 100%. I 100% believe it. And that is telling because that will likely come in a bit later on what extent Alex went to. Uh, Lindsay Blake had a couple more questions for Melanie Gibb. And then it was John Pryor's to take take turn to take the reins and grill Gibb, you could say. And it lasted for a few hours and he's not done. It's going to continue tomorrow. Um, one of the things I want to play is where John Pryor asked her about energy work and vibrations and dreams and visions. And I don't really know anything about energy work. I guess I learned a little bit today. So did we all. Uh, but I'm going to play that clip for you, and here's where he asks her to explain energy work and the visions and dreams that were talked about with Chad and Lori. Um, uh, an interview on TV with somebody. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you recall that? Right. That was the wrong clip. We're going to get to that in a minute. Here's the clip I meant to play. Um, like you said, it's not inconsistent with your faith that if you have a dream at night, that uh, that can be perceived as it's not a guarantee, but it can be perceived as a, a vision of something to come in the future, right? Dreams and visions are I, what I've heard is they're a little different from each other. Okay. But yeah. Well, what you heard, you you practice this as well as part of your faith, don't you? I. I don't have those experiences, but it, our faith believes that people can have them. Okay, so is it something that is uh, um, something that someone who has a special gift is given the opportunity to have visions? Is that what that is? I think so. Okay, so your husband has that gift, correct? Yes. And your husband has had numbers of visions, correct? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance? Sustained. But there are people that are appointed to, or not appointed, but who are, are um, have the ability to have these visions, correct? Yes. And you believe that Chad Daybell at one point believed he could have these visions? Yes. Okay. Now, you mentioned something in the beginning, and I saw that in the past interviews and other things that you've done, and we'll get to that in a minute. But you've, uh, you've said that um, at a number of these podcasts, and conferences, Chad has previously talked about um, the fact that he believed his wife Tammy was going to die early. Yeah. And in fact, he brought that up on the uh, pod, pod or at the uh, conference on the 18th in uh, 2018. He discussed that with the folks at the conference that he he relayed to them that uh, he felt that his uh, wife was was you know going to pass early and had been doing that for some time. Right. I'm not sure exactly when that that he shared. I just remember hearing it. Okay. So it's possible that on yeah. October of 2018, uh, at the very time that he met Lori Vallow, the same conference, he had already relayed to the uh, uh, people there that he felt his wife, Tammy, was, was did not have a long life, that it was a, a vision he had about that, right? Before that co conference, it was before he met Lori. I knew of that information. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. I may, yeah. I, and thank you for clarifying that because I, mm -hmm. I may have looked at that differently and I viewed that in a different way. So before Chad even approached the conference with Lori, um, he had been making that revelation at, at conferences prior to that about uh, his wife, Tammy. Yes. Okay. And if I were to tell you that he'd been making that revelation since 2000 or 2015 or 16, would that be consistent with what you know as well? Objection, Your Honor. Stating facts, not in evidence. Sustained. Do you have a time frame as to when 
Chad started uh, making that revelation? Any idea? I would, well, since I got to know him at least in 2017, I would say between 2017 and 2018. Okay. And that's when you first learned of it? Yeah. Okay. That may not have necessarily been when Chad started, uh, you know, expressing his uh, vision about seeing that sort of thing, right? Um, I'm sh can you rephrase that? I'm sorry. Well, that's not necessarily. You heard about it in 2017 or believe that's when you thought it was starting, but it could have been earlier than that, right? Could have been. Okay. Okay. And do the only two people you know who have visions, uh, Chad Daybell and your husband? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Overruled. Are the only two people you know who have visions, Chad Daybell, in your church, of an, uh, the LDS faith, are the only two people you know who have visions, Chad Daybell and, and um, your husband? No, there's others. Okay. And it's not an unusual thing, right? Right. Okay. Now, I do want to go to an area that I think um, I've, I've heard you discuss before. And you talked about it when the prosecuting attorney was talking to you, Ms. Blake. You, you, you use the phrase, and I, and I need you to explain this for me. You use the phrase energy work. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, I'm not, I, I don't understand that very well. So could you explain to me what energy work is? Yes. Um, my exposure has been that when you have a practitioner that um, is communicating with you or your body, uh, they have a certain method that they use through like muscle testing, which if you want me to explain that, but anyway, muscle testing, and they ask the body questions um, about what's going on in your body physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. Um, and then they find different ways to help you feel better by just their different methodologies that they would communicate. It's kind of, a, I don't really know how to explain it very well, but. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll work through that a little bit just so we kind of maybe um, try to make it a little easier for everybody to understand. So methodologies, meaning prayer. Um, well, maybe some people pray. Sure. Meditation. Um, I, I don't know. Okay. It's Let's... possible for some people. I, I haven't had that experience. Okay. Something you've talked about in previous interviews with a number of different people is vibrations. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about what the concept of, in terms of energy work, what are vibrations? I, to my understanding is vibration would be more like a frequency of your body, just like um, music has a vibration and energy to it. And so it has a certain megahertz. And so that vibration can have a certain positive or a negative um, way of expressing itself. Okay, so it's not something that's a, a divine uh, re revelation to you. It's not something that you feel as part of a spiritual thing. Uh, is that what you're telling me? Oh, well, you can, some people describe spiritual things as vibration. So it just depends on the person. Well, you practice this vibrations, have you not? Well, I don't know that I practice. I don't know what you mean by practice it. All right, you utilize it. I'm not really sure what that would mean for me. Utilize vibrations. I don't know. Well, when you make reference in a number of uh, interviews about the concept of vibrations, are you talk? Are we talking about music? Or are we talking about something with religion? I'm just talking about in general. Vibration is an energy that people have around anything that. Um, you know, the world has a vibration. People have vibrations. It's just a frequency that's put off. And, and is that frequency giving you any sort of uh, religious message or any sort of uh, um, revelation of any kind? No, not, not for me. Maybe for others, but not for me. Okay, so there was a lot there about vibrations, energy work, um, megahertz, uh, uh, energy, all, all that sort of stuff. I apologize, John Pryor can be hard to hear because he steps away from that microphone, but um, he talked about that. He was kind of hitting bits and pieces with with uh, Melanie Gibb all over the place. And then yours truly came into the conversation. Pryor asked Melanie Gibb about an interview she did with the news. And um, he was not talking about me per se, but she thought he was. And I'll just play a little clip from that. It, it was 
kind of humorous and I'll be honest, I was wondering where he was going with this and wondering, oh no, what, what, what's going to happen next? But so far, so good. Here's what he said. But you also did a, um, uh, an interview on TV with somebody. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you recall that? I do. Okay. Um, do you remember when that was? Two thousand. See, two thousand. No, I, I'm not recalling that exactly when that was. Okay. It's been so long. I'm sorry. That's okay, and I and I know there's always. Um, and if you would just bear with me. And, but we do know who you spoke to at that point, correct? Right, correct. Who was that? You also spoke. Yes. Okay. Now, um, okay. Oh, that's right. I forgot about Mr. Eden. You also spoke with um, uh, uh, Keith. Yes. Uh, who was that? Um, he is one of the interviewers for Dateline. Okay, and you gave a lengthy discussion with a lengthy uh, interview with him on on uh, a national audience interview. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Now, um, as part of your preparation for that interview, were there any conditions put in place that you were not going to agree to talk about? Um. Maybe possibly, but I can't, I just can't recall what we talked about before. Okay. Okay. So, um, he asked if she had done an interview, she said with Nate Eaton, he said, Oh, I forgot about Mr. Eaton. I was talking more about the Keith Morrison dateline that you did. So I texted Keith. I'm like, Keith, your name's being mentioned here. <laughs> just a heads up. And Keith's producer, um, it went on, the conversation went on to, Basically, John Pryor admitted a text that Melanie Gibbs sent to Rob Wood, who said, Keith and I want to protect the church. I think it's good to do this interview, something in those terms. Uh, now, I don't know if Keith would have necessarily said, I want to do this interview to protect the church. I'm sure what the conversation was like was like, well, we're not going to bash the church because this is not mainstream church teaching, obviously. There's, I don't know how many... LDS, 17 million, 18 million, and they're not all out doing this energy work, vibrate, whatever. So I, I think that's how the conversation went. And and Melanie Gibb texted that to Rob. And then the conversation moved on. He asked about portals. He said that Chad, uh, Melanie Gibb said that Chad told Lori where her portal was in her closet and designated a special spot where she could get revelation or sit in this portal. Um, and then they talked about but you also did oh, a. Uh... they talked about the fact that in the call john Pryor pointed out that lori talked in the singular i know where jj is he is safe i i instead of we and chad daybell said very little other than he did talk about tammy's health and told melanie that she had been sick for some time um they talked about the nightmare again, why, you know, about her getting help. And then we ended court a little early because there was another hearing. So I told you we're going to go long tonight. <laughs> I just had to get this in because I've never seen anything like this. And I was sitting by someone from Court TV who's covered courts for a decade plus. She's never seen anything like this. Let me give you the background. The Friday before jury started, so that would have been March 28th, 29th, at 1145, an attorney named Terry Ratliff out of Mountain Home filed a motion through I-Court, through the online court system, asking to intervene in this case 
and asking the judge to continue the case, meaning push it off. The motion was full of typos. He said in the motion three times that he was Chad Daybell's attorney, but he's not. And the judge had to do something with this motion. He consulted with counsel. Apparently, they found out about this motion Sunday, Easter Sunday, the day before jury selection. They, the attorneys for prosecution and defense all agreed that it could be sealed because they had to get on with jury selection. And who is this guy and what is this motion? And so the judge set today as a motion date and he told Ratliff, the attorney, you have to show up at the courthouse and show cause, show a reason why you should be uh, able to intervene and this case should be paused. Ratliff showed up with his attorney, a guy by the name of Mr. Bartlett. I think it's Michael. Uh, I believe it's Michael. Um, and here's what happened. <laughs> I'm going to play it. I'll come on and talk. His mic wasn't on at one point. You couldn't hear him. I'll try to talk over it and explain to you what happened. But uh, again, just watch. States here present, not currently seated at the prosecutor's table. Seated there is attorney Terry S. Ratliff, along with a, uh, another attorney, Mr. Bartlett, who represents Mr. Ratliff. The court is taking up today an order to show cause hearing, and I'm going to briefly discuss the procedural history that brings us to this at this time. I'll note that this was a motion that was filed by Mr. Ratliff, who is a bar licensed attorney through the state of Idaho and filed a pleading purporting to be the attorney for the defendant in this case. And the pleading was filed on March 29th at 11.42 p.m., so shortly before midnight on a Friday and I do want to discuss briefly the timing of the filing. The court was conducting jury questionnaires and preparing for jury voir dire in this case, which of course is a capital murder case, an incredibly serious case where the court counsel has spent a tremendous amount of time preparing for and getting ready for trial where we are now. The court uh, was not made aware of the filing because it was not entered in the case until Sunday morning on March 29th, the day, I'm sorry, that would have been on March 31st. That was Easter Sunday before we were going to start with our voir dire the following Monday. On Easter Sunday, my staff attorney who had an opportunity finally to travel home and spend Easter with her family after a very long week, uh, was interrupted out of her church services and contacted the court that we had an emergency. Okay, pause right there. So Boyce says he was notified about this motion Sunday. Remember, they had been in Boise preparing for jury selection, going through all of these questionnaires. They finally get to go home for Easter ahead of this eight week trial, his staff attorney sitting in church for Easter Sunday and gets this notice that there's this motion to intervene. And what, what do you do? I mean, what if this was a, a real serious motion, like an issue that something needs to be done? This trial needs to be interrupted. You know, something has to happen. Let me pick it up from there. I really wish that the attorney's microphone would have been on um, so you could hear him. You, you can't really hear him at all. And by the way, I should say no fault to him. This was probably the first time he's been in this particular courtroom and he had just come in at the tail end. So he didn't know which button to push. Unlike Pryor, who has had some experience with the microphones. Um, so I'll pick it up right where the judge said we were sitting in church and we get a notice that this motion has been filed. Let me just make this big. Here we go. 
but you are. The state's here present election on Easter Sunday. The pleading the court received is entitled motion to intervene and to continue the trial in these proceedings filed by Mr. Ratliff on his official office pleading letterhead signed by Mr. Ratliff as the attorney for the defendant, both on the signature line and on the caption. I'll note the pleading incorrectly spells the word motion. It incorrectly spells the word continue. It incorrectly spells the word proceedings in its caption. And when I reviewed this, I'm gonna tell you, Mr. Ratliff, I was angry then and I think I'm angrier now about what you did. However, in light of allowing you some due process, I looked through a correct way to handle this and I considered rule 11. I'll note you've retained an attorney, Mr. Bartliff, I'm sorry, Bartlett, and I have reviewed a lengthy response brief along with declarations submitted on your behalf and procedurally where we are, first of all, the cause for me is for you to explain, Mr. Ratliff, to personally explain to me how your pleading complies with rule 11 of the rules of civil procedure. Typically when someone shows up with an attorney, their attorney gets, their attorney gets to talk is what Boyce is saying. But Boyce is telling this attorney you have to answer my questions because you filed this and you're an attorney and you can't let your attorney answer the questions. So um, the attorney tries to speak here and I'm going to show you, I believe that it's muted. And what, what happens here? Hold on. As to some of my questions, uh, I am not going to turn this into an adjunct litigation under the auspices of this capital murder case because quite frankly, you don't represent the defendant here. You don't represent the state. You're not a party. And I'm not gonna let this devolve into a whole separate procedural mess in this case and create a record of some side issue that has nothing to do with the charges the state is currently putting evidence on for. So, so now that I've had my say, so he tells um, the attorney, Ratliff, you can argue it. You can answer my questions, not your attorney, though, because you're the one that filed it. His attorney then says, well, judge, the reason I came is because two days ago I spoke to your, we only got notice of this hearing two days ago. And your attorney said I could come. And the judge said something like, oh, were you inconvenienced by the short timing? Were you inconvenienced by it? That was rich because obviously the judge was saying we were inconvenienced by it, by what happened here. So he says, I'm going to let you consult with your attorney for a minute, not long, for a minute. And you can decide if you're going to answer my questions. And if you will answer my questions, I will ask them to for you and give you due process. But I'm not going to have your attorney answer them on behalf of, of you. Um, I don't get the motivation here. I don't, I don't understand it. And by the way, I don't know what the motion says it's sealed. Maybe it won't be now, but, um, whatever it was, the judge obviously didn't find anything of merit in it. And so he had some questions for Terry Ratliff. So they leave the courtroom, they go outside. I'm going to fast forward to the place where they come in. Um, and Terry Ratliff says, okay, I'm going to answer, I'm going to answer some questions for you. And this is good. Uh, I'm going to play from right here. The state's here present, not currently seated at the Oops, cross. Sorry. I thought to have counsel represent them on a rule 11. If you file a frivolous civil rules under rule 11 and what you certify and you answer those, in my opinion, and I'm the judge here, 
This is how you address rule 11. So with all due respect, Mr. Bartliff, I appreciate you attempting to and wanting to represent your client. Again, you can do that. You've talked to him before. You can talk to him after. But the questions I have on rule 11 relate directly to a pleading that Mr. Ratliff filed as licensed attorney in this case. And I have a right to ask him about his pleading that he filed. And so if you want to take a moment to consult with him, you can do that. But I'm not going to have you argue the merits of this. That will be up to you or Mr. Ratliff. I said I have an opportunity to speak with him. So thank you so much for that. Okay. The bailiff I'll, then uh, turned on the mic take, for take him. The time you need. I don't want to spend much more time this afternoon. We're in the middle of this trial. We've had evidence today. We're going to have evidence tomorrow. Make it quick and then let me know what your client wants to do. Yes, sure. All right. Then you they did, came in back. fact, file this electronically in CR. Uh, well, that's wrong to the case number, but this is case CR 22, 21, 16, 23. Did you catch that? He got the case number wrong in the filing. Oh, is that correct? That's correct. All right. I'll note the uh, case number is wrong as well. You've got it CR 12, 21. Uh, the first part I want to know under rule 11, which requires you to make representations to the court, you hold yourself out as entitle yourself attorney for the defendant. Why do you say that? Judge, as you know, this is a template form and I simply forgot to take that off of there. That was Scrivener's error on my behalf. Okay, Scrivener's error. On the- If you, if you notice in the body of the, the motion, Judge, I say without permission of the defendant or his trial counsel, all right, let's look at your signature on page three. You signed Terry S. Ratliff of the firm attorney for the defendant on page three, don't you? Again, because it was in my template. All right, on page two, again, a signature, Terry S. Ratliff of the firm attorney for the defendant, correct? I don't have page three, Joe. I just have a page one or two. bottom of the certificate of service is one signature another at the bottom of the contents of the pleading if it's there judge it's there because it's a template form and i didn't strike it okay so three times you called yourself the attorney for the defendant um so who are you the attorney for me so terry s ratliff attorney for terry s ratliff in this case i should have signed citizen Citizen? Yes. Why are you referencing your bar number if you're just citizen? Again, it's the form, Judge. It's it's a reference to the form. I'm not Mr. Daybell's attorney, never was. You put this on a pleading. If you look at the top left, you've got your name, your Idaho State bar number, your Ratliff Law Offices, an attorney for defendant, you're telling me you mistakenly just wanted to file something as a citizen and not as a lawyer? I was looking for immediate relief because of the current concerns I had about the case, Your Honor. And why were you doing that on on a Friday night at almost midnight? What because You've known about this case for a long time, according to your own content here, right? That's correct. So why are you doing it then? Because I thought I needed to do something to slow it down. Trial scheduled for how many years? And you wanted to slow it down the day before trial started? I'd also gotten calls from Mr. Pryor, Judge, for help. That might be fine, but did he ever retain you on the case or did you ever enter an appearance for the defendant? I did not. All right, and you do state in here you're filing this pleading without the permission of the defendant or his counsel, correct? That's correct. You also state in here and call yourself an intervener. What basis do you have to intervene? Based on my, on the brief? Yeah. It's, it's set out in our brief, Judge, as to the basis for why I wanted to intervene. Hmm. I, in the motion, I quote you the relief I wanted. I give you the grounds on page one as to why I wanted that relief and why I thought it was necessary. Okay, and you're gonna intervene now, not as Terry Ratliff lawyer, Terry Ratliff citizen at large? I think it's semantics, Your Honor. Oh boy. Let me stop you there. It's absolutely not. A bar licensed attorney filing something with their bar number 
to the court is completely different than a citizen. That is not semantics. This is I, what brings you within the auspices of Rule 11. I understand. I said perhaps I should have signed it as a citizen, but I didn't. All right. In your intent to intervene, whether it's as a citizen or an attorney, let me read you a couple of case quotes. Quote, the Idaho rules of criminal procedure do not provide a process for intervention. The inability of non-parties to intervene in a criminal case recognizes that the considerations underlying intervention in civil cases are not applicable to criminal proceedings. That's People versus Ham, and that's State versus Johnson 167, Idaho 454. And we've also got another Idaho case citing, quote, petitioners are correct that Idaho's rules of criminal procedure do not provide a specific mechanism for third parties to intervene in a criminal case. So again, I think there's settled case law that prohibits intervention in a criminal case. And I'd like to know what authority you have that says you have a right to intervene either as an attorney or a citizen in this case. As outlined in our brief, Judge, sorry about that. As outlined in our brief, we have given the court several cases where the Idaho appellate courts have allowed people to intervene in cases in a criminal matter, even though they're not parties. That's my basis. So you intervene and then uh, we've got two parties here. We've got the state, we've got Chad Daybell, and you're going to float around and be what if you intervene in this case? What are you gonna be? I'm not gonna be floating around this case, Judge, because you haven't granted my motion. Well, assuming you got to intervene, you assumed in your motion you did intervene because you called yourself the intervener once you got going in your motion. What were you gonna be at that point? I was hoping to have a hearing in front of you before the trial started. Okay, and you said you were gonna be the lawyer for the defendant or already were the lawyer for the defendant, is not. that? Not, I explained to you just a few minutes ago that that was a mistake. Explain to me all of the misspellings and typographical errors in your late night filing. I was nervous and it was late at night. I didn't take this lightly. You didn't take it lightly, but you used the wrong form. You misrepresented if you were an attorney or a citizen and you signed three times as attorney for defendant. Um, and that's your explanation? Yes. All right. Mr. Ratliff, I find based on your responses, you have violated Idaho's Rule 11 under the Rules of Civil Procedure, which I find are incorporated through Idaho Criminal Rule 47 and 49. The court would note that in the rules under C1, not it's uh, mandatory. It says the court must impose an appropriate sanction on an attorney, law firm, or party that violated the rule. And similar to what would happen in a civil case with a frivolous type filing, which this was, this cost time, this cost effort, this cost real loss for the attorneys, for the court. I'm going to instruct counsel for both the state and the defense if they could itemize the time they have spent both in today's hearing, in preparing for the hearing, as well as in dealing with this pleading from the time it was filed on Friday night, the 29th, whatever time you put into that, I'm gonna direct Mr. Ratliff that you pay reasonable attorney fees incurred for the time Mr. Pryor spent at his typical hourly rate for the state's attorneys and whatever rate they are entitled to charge as public prosecutors. And the court will likewise itemize some billing time incurred in this. And the sanction the court's going to order is the payment of those attorney fees. The court will provide time for counsel to submit those. I'll review those for reasonableness before I make an order. And pursuant to the rule, which requires a written order under Rule C6 of Rule 11, the court will describe in that order the conduct and the basis for the sanction, and you're going to pay for those fees. Do you understand that, Mr. Ratliff? That's fine, Judge. Very well. That'll be Your Honor, if I may, um, I'm going to request findings of fact and conclusions of law. As this court is aware, we submitted briefing that addressed many of the issues you addressed to Mr. Ratliff in, 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 great, in great detail, giving multiple basis for his 
right to intervene. The judge, you have not addressed those arguments. And so I'm going to ask for findings of fact, conclusions of law. All right. Well, Mr. Bartliff, you can ask. I'm not inclined to do that because, again, I've got a lawyer in front of me that submitted a pleading, and the lawyer is responsible for the pleading. Uh, I'm not necessarily uh, allowing any further input on behalf of counsel for the lawyer that filed the pleading. Uh, I don't think it's proper because I'm not uh, imposing any kind of jail time or sanction similar to Rule 75 of the civil rules, which would implicate on a contempt proceeding the right to counsel. So uh, I'm going to stand by my ruling that I made and ask the attorneys to submit those. That concludes the matter for this judge, afternoon. Judge, if I may. I'm you sorry, may, judge. I am you may not. I'm done. I'm done with this issue and I'm done wasting time on this issue in the middle of a capital case. We're done. We're in recess, period. Oh, wow. <laughs> Again, I have never seen anything like that. Um imagine you are preparing for the biggest trial of your life to preside over it imagine you've gone through four years of preparation and getting a jury ready i, I, I just imagine that and then this comes in at the last minute no wonder the judge was a little upset i have i have not seen boys like that before i know that the feeling in the courtroom was like, oh my, this was done, by the way, out of the presence of the jury. The judge sent the jury home. This was a separate matter, a separate hearing. After I went up outside of the courtroom and I asked Mr. Ratliff if he wanted to comment with his attorney, he said, no, I ran out of the courtroom as fast as I could and got this video of them leaving. You can see they have nothing to say. That's Mr. Ratliff there on the, I guess, screen, had to turn around, screen right and his attorney on the left. So, maybe one day we will find out just why he filed this. But what are your thoughts? 11.45, the Friday before a death penalty murder case, and this is filed. Now, many of you are saying, did he really say prior contacted him? I don't doubt that. This attorney is death penalty qualified. Prior um, reached, said, he has said in court that he has reached out to several death penalty attorneys across the state of Idaho. So I wouldn't doubt that he did reach out to him to say, can you help me on this case? But he did say in his own motion that he's not representing, wait, he did say he's representing Chad three times, was not representing him at all. It, then he said he wasn't representing them. So... I don't know. The judge put this to bed um, and showed the seriousness of you're going to file something. You're going to pay us back if there's nothing valid there. Again, we have so much to talk about, but I'm about done. My voice is about shot. Before we go, let's remember Tammy Daybell tonight. This is from the Tammy Douglas Daybell Foundation page. You can go on there. They're posting beautiful pictures uh, all throughout the trial. There's Tammy with her sister when they were younger. And um, I know that this time is quite heavy for them, as it is with all of the families involved in this case. And so we're thinking about them tonight and remembering Tammy. Of course, we also remember JJ, Tylee, and Charles, and the family members who really didn't know what was happening in all of this, who have suffered for quite some time. And of course, now having the trial back in the headlines, it brings up a lot of those feelings. But we're thinking about them. And I want to thank you for watching. I don't think we'll get to questions tonight because we've gone so long. I do want to tell you that tomorrow, court begins again at 8.30. The judge has said we're going to go all day again. I'm going home tomorrow right when court ends. So courtroom insider will be late. We're still going to do it, but it will be late unless we get out early. If that makes sense. If we get out around noon, I'll be live from my house at our normal time. If we get out at 3.30, I'll probably go live around 9 o'clock. So it'll be uh, courtroom insider after dark or something like that. And I have an announcement tomorrow night I want to share with you about next week uh, and the trial and our coverage and whatnot. So I hope you'll join me. Thank you so much for staying with us tonight. I know it was long. There was a lot to talk about. I didn't even scratch the surface. But we'll go into more detail tomorrow. Melanie Gibb is back on the stand. Pryor has more questions for her. Then more witnesses will be called. We don't know who yet. 
but uh, there'll be a lot to talk about. And if you want to go back and watch anything that we talked about in full, listen to the phone calls. We've got all of that on our YouTube page. Don't forget EastIdahoNews.com, your number one source for everything on this trial. And you can follow me here, Facebook, Insta, X, and on the YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. See you tomorrow.